minutes or so, I'll introduce you a little bit to our workplace and, and also give you one example of a, an exciting project uh, that, that we're part of. So let me share my screen. Okay, so to begin with, I'll, I'll start by describing the training and research opportunities uh, available in, in Porto. Um, I'll, I'll put some emphasis on the training, both because uh, that's, that's the stage most of you are at the moment, and also because I'm, I'm the coordinator of the training unit of the Center of Astrophysics, which is a rather um, peculiar institution. And, and that's actually the, uh, the main point uh, I want to emphasize to begin with. Um, so the Center for Astrophysics at the University of Porto um, is a private nonprofit uh, scientific and technical uh, in institution um, recognized as being of public utility, um, which has a statutory goal, the support and promotion of astronomy through it, its various components, including research, uh, education, and science outreach. Um, so this is not a normal university department or, or a or even a normal research center, uh, but it does have uh, privileged connections with other research centers, with the University of Porto and so on. You can see in the diagram a little bit of the, um, the organization of the Center of Astrophysics. So there's a research unit that I'll come to uh, in the next slide. Uh, there's an administration and services unit, uh, which includes uh, branch managers, secretaries, uh, system manager, porters, and so on. There's an outreach unit and planetarium. So we have a planetarium in our building, so we share the space with a planetarium. So, so we're very close to the public and, uh, and to the people who do outreach for a living. Uh, but there's also a, a training unit, which I coordinate, whose goal it is to provide additional training opportunities, which complement those offered by the university and uh, and, 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 other, and other components. So the research unit is what's called IA, so the Institute of Astrophysics and Space Sciences. So this is what we could call a virtual institute in the sense that it has no legal existence, but it's a recognized um, research unit by the, by the Portuguese Research Council. So this includes um, us in Porto, the Center for Astrophysics, and also nodes in, in Lisbon and more recently Coimbra. And again, for administrative reasons, it's organized in, in five groups, um, which have slightly cumbersome names, but you can basically think of them as planets, stars, galaxies, cosmology slash fundamental physics, and the an astronomical instrumentation group, which is um, sort of transversal to, to, all the, to all the other groups. There's also, of course, various contacts between the various groups, a lot of people do work that can be fitted in, in, in various of these groups. So, so this is a, an administrative organization more than a, a rigid organization. Um, and I'll give myself as an example as, a, as someone who works uh, and contributes to, to more than one of these groups. So that will be the next slide. Uh, before that, let, let, let me just give you an, an idea of the numbers involved. So at the bottom of the slide, you see the uh, numbers applicable to the IA as a whole on the left and specifically to COPE on the right. So uh, in Porto, we have slightly more than half of the researchers and of the PhD students uh, in the whole IA, but we have almost 90% of the junior students in IA. So this is um, in part uh, because there are opportunities pr provided by the University of Porto for junior students, and we take advantage of that. But it's also in part uh, due to the internal efforts that we make to integrate junior students in research projects and give them opportunities early on for them to start exploring this path. Um, so just to illustrate a little bit what I do, I can explain this later on in the questions if you want. Um, so I'm, I'm a cosmologist by training. I, I started life as a theorist, but now I, I work more or less at the interface between theory and observations. And, and I'm involved in various uh, projects, both of ESO and of ESA, 
the LT is, is one example that I'll mention uh, later on. Um, and what I do essentially is to try and understand uh, whether the laws of physics are universal, whether gravity is just geometry as, as Einstein uh, suggested, what makes the universe accelerate and, and so on. And I'm also uh, quite involved in, uh, in, in training and outreach. Uh, that's something that, that, I, that I enjoy doing. And I think it's part of the uh, social responsibility of any science. Okay, so, so moving to the training part. So there's obviously formal training provided by the University of Porto. Um, and this includes both training in physics and training in astronomy. And, and the, uh, again, there's no rigid borders between the two. It's quite common for students to do an undergraduate degree in physics and then a master's in astronomy or, or switch uh, topics slightly between the master's and PhD and so on. So there's no rigid commitment that you're making by, by starting a specific degree in a given topic. Anyway, so, so we have a first degree in physics. We have masters both in astronomy and astrophysics and in physics. We also have an integrated masters in physics in engineering. So, so this is a five-year degree that includes uh, essentially a first degree followed by a masters. And we have doctoral programs in astronomy and in physics and the physics one is joined with two other Portuguese universities. Uh, again, there's no, uh, also, although the, uh, the astronomy and physics PhD programs have slightly different rules, uh, there's no rigid boundaries. And um, for example, being a cosmologist, uh, I supervise students that are working in cosmology and doing the astronomy masters. And I supervise students that are working in cosmology doing uh, the, the physics PhD program. Okay, so, so that's what. The university provides uh, as, as part of, of its uh, part of its roles. Uh, what do we, Center of Astrophysics, provide specifically in the training unit? So we have two levels of activities, what we call internal and external activities. Um, so, so first, we, we organize our own advanced courses and cookie seminars. So advanced courses are courses on specific topics. Uh, sometimes given by us, sometimes given by people who visit us. And a lot of these courses are proposed by students. So maybe a PhD students tell me, we'd like to learn a bit more about uh, photometry or, or whatever. Uh, and whenever that need arises, we try to provide this additional training. Uh, sometimes the, the the courses are more hands-on. So we just recently had a course on Python for astronomers, for example. Um, so, so we, we can, can try to, to accommodate whatever needs the students have. The cookie seminars are seminars organized by the PhD students. So they are informal seminars where students can come and, and explain their work in an informal way. Uh, they're called cookie seminars because there's cookies and fruit juice at the end at least when the seminars are in person. Um, we also have broad skills training. So, so for example, we have a, a job application workshop every year where students will answer a, a mock uh, job application and then we put them through a mock job interview to try and give them a little bit of feedback of how, how well they're, they're doing. Uh, we have workshops on writing proposals to get telescope time and various other things. So we try to give the students all the, uh, all the skills that, that they will need uh, throughout their uh, careers or wherever, it, whether it's in academia or elsewhere. We have a very active program of junior research internships. And so what I mean junior is undergraduate degree students or first year master students. So typically we host 15 to 20 internships per year. Uh, these internships usually last three to six months, sometimes a bit longer. Um, and you can get to one of these internships either internally through the University of Porto. Uh, so the Faculty of Sciences has a, an internship program called PEC. Uh, but these are also open to foreign students. Frequently receive students doing Erasmus, uh, French students doing master's internships. Uh, we, we have four in, in Kaupa at the moment. Um, 
And in addition to formal internships, um, informal visits of students to CAUP whenever they want to interact with us uh, in, in a more systematic way, uh, can also be organized if they are planned in, well enough in advance. Uh, students themselves lead some training activities. We have a programmers club, occasionally we have act days and so on. Um, and we also have specific activities. For example, we have a student's day every year where we present the, uh, the PhD thesis or master's thesis that researchers in the institution offer for the next academic year. Uh, and these are also published in what we call a project booklet. So if anyone is considering CAUP as, as a possible place to work next year, I can tell you that the projects booklet for the next academic year is already available. And if you're interested in having a look at them, just drop me an email at the end and I can send you the PDF. Um, then we have external activities. Um, and this thing, again, there's, there's a range of them. I'll just mention the more important ones. Um, so we participate in TTC. So this means teacher training courses. So these are courses for high school teachers. Um, and they are aimed at, at these teachers, but whenever we organize one of them as a point of principle, we open the course to other people, whether it's students from the University of Porto or anyone else, so they can attend the course and, and so on. So, so again, just to give you an illustration, currently we have three of these courses. So there's one essentially on history of ideas in astronomy, uh, another one called New Tools for Astronomy in Secondary Education, which as the name suggests, specifically aimed at uh, secondary school teachers, for example, trying to uh, get them to learn a little bit about coding, which is, a, which is quite a steep learning curve if, if you think that most of these teachers in Portugal are in their 50s or 60s. Uh, and we also have a course called the Physics of Everyday Life, which is essentially applications of physics in everyday situations like global warming, radioactivity, cancer, satellites, etc. Uh, we also actively mentor high school students. We organize, for example, job shadowing days. So high school students can visit us for a day and follow one of us around. So they are our shadow for that day and they can see what is you know, one day of work or, or as an astronomer or a physicist. Uh, we visit uh, schools very frequently. Typically we give 30 to 50 talks in schools, mostly secondary schools, but some uh, younger students as well. And we also have actually research internships for secondary school students. Not many of them, but uh, a few of them a year are, are typically organized. These are usually internships done during the summer, so sometimes in July, sometimes in September. Uh, and again, it's, a, it's an opportunity for students to uh, experience being an astronomer for a few days and a few weeks and seeing if that's something that they'd like to do in the future. And finally, I, I, I cannot resist mentioning one other thing, which I think is one of our flagship activities. And, I must say I'm biased because I'm the organizer of that. Um, and I think it's really a unique uh, program. It's a two week uh, summer school for high school students, uh, which is already in its 10th edition. The idea is we take bright, motivated high school students. Uh, currently 42 countries are eligible to apply uh, and we isolate them for two weeks in the mountains in the north of Portugal. So they're not allowed to access the internet. They're not allowed to use mobile phones. Uh, but the idea is that they are there in lockdown in a sense for two weeks and learn uh, physics and astronomy intensively. Uh, so so I, I think it's, it's a very, as an organizer, it's always very rewarding for me to organize. And I think it's a program that, that the students that, that are selected to participate in job. So, uh, all of you are in university, I know, so you are not eligible to apply, but if you have uh, uh, younger siblings or other people that you know that, that may be interested in applying, uh, you can bring this to their attention. Uh, so this year's edition is already closed, so the applications closed uh, more than a week ago, but you know, there's always an excuse. Okay, and, and with that, uh, so, so that's the end of the, uh, 
the first presentation. So I don't know, Sophia, maybe, maybe it's a good idea to stop now for questions before we move to the, the science talk. Uh, yeah, for, for sure, of, of course. Sorry, I was going to say two things at once. Uh, does anyone have any questions? No one has any questions about the opportunities at IA and COPE? I believe not. So, Professor Carlos, you can continue if you want. Okay, so, so let me just switch slides. Okay, so that's the presentation. And okay, everything's looking good. All right, so 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 now I'm, I'm putting my uh, my scientist head on, uh, and I'm, I'll, I'll explain to you a little bit what is this uh, ELT or Extremely Large Telescope. Uh, so this is a project that has occupied me for the last 10 years, not full time, of course, but maybe 10 to 20% of my work time, depending on, on, the, on the time of the year. And it will probably occupy me even more for the next 10 years. So, so I want to, what I want to do is to give you a little bit of a, an insider's view of what it is to, to, uh, to be part of a project like this. Okay, so, so let me jump straight to the, uh, to, to explain what, what the project is. Uh, so the ELT is a, is a 40 meter class telescope, uh, which will be, when it's finished, uh, the largest optical and infrared telescope in the world. Um, so it will be in Amazon, is in, in Chile, very close to where the VLT currently is. So I'll, I'll show you a, a picture of it in a, in a moment. Um, its design is, is quite revolutionary. No one has ever built anything like this or even close to, to, uh, to it. Uh, by design, it has active optics incorporated. It has adaptive optics. And it's designed to perform at the diffraction limit. Um, it has a wide field of view. Uh, I don't know how, how much familiar you, you are uh, with astronomical concepts, but 10, 10 arc minute field of view for a large telescope like this is, is actually a very large uh, number. And achieving that is a, is a technical challenge on its own. It covers uh, the visible and infrared wavelength range, so 0.3 to 24 micron. Um, and it's designed to have very fast efficiency in operations and in particular in instrument change. What this means is that if the telescope is looking at some point in the sky and something interesting happens in another point in the sky, like a supernova exploding or something like that, the telescope must have the capability to drop everything, so to speak, point in the other place in the sky, calibrate, et cetera, do everything that it needs to do and be able to observe this new object in just 10 or 20 minutes. This is actually technically extremely difficult if you think that you have to move thousands of, of tons of, of material. I'll, I'll give you some, some numbers in a moment. So the project was approved by the ESO Council in 2012. Uh, Portugal joined slightly later, but that's, uh, uh, and it's, it's a, the budget is, is over a billion euros. Um, and it's designed to have an operational lifetime of at least 30 years. So, so those of you uh, who are starting careers in astronomy will have access to this telescope throughout a significant fraction of your working life. And, and it's, there's, it's already foreseen that some upgrades might be it might, might, might be done in the future. Now I will talk about the ELT, so the European Extremely Large Telescope. I just want to mention briefly that there's two other extremely large telescopes. These are US based. So there's the GMT, the Giant Magellan Telescope, uh, which, which, has, which is a telescope with, with an effective area of, or an effective diameter of 24 and a half meters, uh, which will be in Las Campanas in Chile. So not, not that far from the ELT. 
uh, and then there's the TMT, which means 30 meter telescope, um, which might be in Mauna Kea uh, in Hawaii, or it might be in the Canary Islands. So as you might know, there's been some issues in selecting the, the site for, for the telescope. So both of these uh, projects are US based, but they, they have funds from other countries as well. Uh, the LT is the European one, and it's actually there's interesting sociological differences in the way each group approaches the, the design and build of the telescope and so on. Okay, so, so here's a picture to uh, locate you geographically. So on the bottom, you see Paranal, where, where the VLT telescopes are. Uh, and about 20 kilometers away as the crow flies, you have Cerro Amazonas, where the, the ELT will be. So, so in fact, from the point of view of the logistics ESO, of ESO, Paranal and Amazonas will be a single observatory different physical sites. All right, so, so let me tell you a little bit about the, uh, the design and, and, the, and some of the technology of the telescope. So the telescope is what's called an azimuth telescope, which has a segmented primary mirror. Um, it has five different mirrors. So there's five different optical surfaces through which the photons have to go through. Uh, the first, Three mirrors are classical anastigmat mirrors. The other two are flat, very thin mirrors. These are the ones that are used uh, to do ad adaptive optics. So they're mirrors that you can deform in order to correct the, the effects of the distortions of the atmosphere. Um, and at each side of, of, the, uh, of the primary mirror, you have two instrument platforms uh, where you can put your instruments. And each of these platforms uh, is basically the size of a, of a tennis court. And the telescope is as nearly 3,000 tons of moving stroke. So whenever you're rotating the telescope, you point it somewhere, that's 3,000 tons of stuff that you're moving. Uh, so here's a, a picture to, to maybe illustrate a little bit more the structure. Uh, so if you're pointing straight up, you, so the, so the primary mirror, the bottom, here's the secondary one, then the tertiary is here. And then you have a fourth and fifth, um, which, which are the, the thin ones. And these are the ones that you use to, to point the light to one of these platforms that are at either side of the, uh, of the primary mirror. So how do you design something like this? Well, obviously you cannot design a monolithic 39.3 meter mirror. So what you do is you segment it. Uh, so the LT will have 798 hexagons, each of which has 1 meter 45 uh, in length from, from tip to tip of the hexagon uh, and about five centimeters thickness. And so there's 798 of it, but there's actually uh, a six fold symmetry. So we have basically six petals, each of which has 133. And in each petal, each of the 133 segments as a different shape. So the surface has a different curvature. So it has to be manufactured differently. It's not 133 equal segments, it's 133 different segments. So there's, there's basically two or three companies in the world that can do this to, to be accurate, uh, to, 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 the, to the required level of accuracy. Um, in addition, you have a seventh copy, so a seventh petal, because the idea is that during the day, so each day when you're not observing, you take away two of the hexagons uh, and you replace them by their twins. And you take these two ex hexagons to a, to a polishing area. So you repolish two of the segments each day, which basically means that after one year, you have a completely new repolished surface of, of the telescope. So that's why you keep it, that's how you keep it polished. Um, and the fourth and fifth mirrors, uh, so here what you see is the back ends of, of both of them. Uh, they're actually extremely uh, thin, less, less than two millimeters. Uh, and in the fourth one, we have several thousand actuators that are supposed to deform the shape of the mirror in real time, so more than a thousand times a second, to correct for the distortions uh, introduced by the atmosphere. So this is what you call adaptive optics. You try and figure out in real time what kinds of distortions the atmosphere is creating in your image 
and you just correct the shape of the mirror to get rid of that as, as well as you can. Uh, so here's a, a larger picture of four of these segments. So this is a few years ago when they were still being tested with different materials. And you, you, you see underneath the very complicated structure uh, to, to support them uh, and to deform them in, in, the, in the appropriate way. So you, you have to realize that depending on the position of the telescope, gravity itself will deform the, uh, the mirror. So the, the weight of, of the mirror is substantial. And you have to correct for that as well in order to have uh, uh, good enough images. So, so all of this has to be done. And here's an illustration of a test on the VLT uh, of the impact of adaptive optics. So these are two images taken on the same night with the same telescope and with, with the same instrument, uh, but switching on or on adaptive optics. And so here you clearly see the effect of the atmosphere, right? The atmosphere gives you a blur, uh, but you can correct for it to, to a certain degree and, and get a a much, much cleaner image. Um, so, so obviously that there's, there's an advantage in doing that if, if you can do it at all. Um, so, so the ELT by design will, will be able to do this. Um, the dome, in a sense, it's, it's the more classical thing of the whole project. It's a, you know, it's a dome, um, except that it's, again, more than 3,000 tons of steel. So it's, it's not, a, not a tiny thing to build. And that there's one other aspect to it, is that it must be fully air conditioned and will wind shielded. Uh, so why do you want that? Because observing time in a big telescope is expensive. ESO is supported by the taxes of all the ESO member countries. So it's supported by my, my taxes and the taxes of, uh, well, not necessarily you that are listening to me, but parents of, of many of you. Um, so to give you an idea, one night of observing time on the VLT costs around 50,000 euros. The estimate is that for the ELT, the effective cost to taxpayers will be 10 euros per second. So obviously you want to make the most of, of, of telescope time. And one thing you don't want is in the beginning of the night, when you start observing, you open the dome. You don't want to have a gradient of temperature between the outside and the inside of the dome, because that will create turbulence, that will create wind currents, and, and you would not be able to observe until things are a little, a little bit more stabilized. So to guard against that, what you have to ensure is that at the moment when you open the dome, the temperature inside is exactly the same as the temperature outside. So there's no there's none of these gradients and you know, everything is stable very quickly and you can go straight into observing and, and getting good scientific data. So that is the challenge. You need to, to, to have a, a temperate, so conditions inside that match the ones outside at the moment when you open the door. And you need some algorithms to try and predict what the temperature will be at the end of the day and try to regulate the temperature inside the dome during the day so that you are at, at the right point when the dome is open. Um, and this is a picture of what uh, it will look like in the end. So for, uh, for scale, you can see a truck at the, uh, at the bottom uh, of the picture. So, so this, is, this is a huge structure, but hopefully many of you will, will have a chance to, uh, to see it in person some years from now. Um, so even though the construction is still ongoing, so first light will be in, a, in about four years, um, this is a long-term project. And here, I, I just want to illustrate this very simply. Um, so, so the orange um, line shows the cumulative uh, amount of, um, of money committed, committed in contracts. So most of, most of the money uh, has already been spent some years ago. Um, and the bars show you the number of major contracts. So major here means uh, larger than half a million euros. So ba basically all these contracts have already been signed um, 
So, so at, at the moment, people are just you know, finishing building the, uh, the structure and assembling all the pieces together. But the money has had to be gathered and, and committed long ago. So this is part of the reason why these projects uh, are measured in, in decades, essentially, and not in, in years. Um, I also want to mention, and because this is a point that a lot of people uh, raise these days, uh, what's the point of, of doing fundamental science in a sense? So very briefly, I want to illustrate two examples, two cases where technology developed uh, due to the LT or driven by the needs of, of astronomy has already had the impact uh, more widely. So one is the technology needed for, for these adaptive optics and the formable mirrors that I mentioned. Um, some, some of the techniques de uh, developed in this context are already being used in, in eye medical imaging, uh, because obviously, you know, if you think about it, if you want to look at the back of the eye, you have you know, fluid in, in front of you, uh, making life difficult for you. And that's exactly what the atmosphere does to an astronomy. It's not, Surprising to, uh, to 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 find out that the same kind of techniques can be used and have medical applications. Essentially, the same is true of uh, what's called confocal mi microscopy, and there's also some applications in laser welding and high power lasers. And of these, I, I know less about. But they're all spin-offs in a sense from uh, adaptive optics. Another one is, which I didn't mention specifically, is what's called laser guide stars. So to do this adaptive optics, sometimes you rely on a star whose brightness you know, uh, but when you don't have one nearby, you create your own star in the atmosphere. So you use a powerful laser to excite some oxygen atoms in, in the atmosphere um, and create an artificial star. And there, since you know what the star looks like, you know its brightness and you know its position on the sky because you know you made the star. You can look at what is what the telescope is seeing and can use that information uh, to figure out what adaptive optics correction you need. Now, since you want to to excite this particular transition, you need a, a Raman laser with, with a 589 nanometer wavelength. And it turns out, as also, these have been developed for, for the ELT, and it turns out that this is the ideal wavelength for the treatment of, of some types of skin ca cancer. So previously, when lasers were used in, in skin cancer, lasers with other wavelengths were used. Uh, it turns out, and this is biology, so I'm not specialist on that, but it turns out that this wavelength is particularly good uh, for skin cancer treatment. And there are several hospitals in two or three countries in Europe that are already using these lasers these, these days. And you know, if one day uh, you develop skin cancer, maybe it's treated with technology that was uh, developed initially for the yacht. Okay, so let, let me get to a, to a bit of science. Um, when you go through a project like this, you need to, to have an overall vision for your project. Um, and there's two points that, that should be mentioned here. So first, uh, as any scientist knows, whenever you open par your parameter space, whenever you look somewhere that, never, that has never been looked at before, uh, you always find surprises. Right? We find some things we might expect, but we find unexpected things. Um, so opening parameter space is good in itself. Uh, then DLT should do what it's good at. So if, particularly if you compare it to other large, extremely large telescopes, DLT is good in collecting power. It's a bigger primary mirror and also in spatial resolution. So essentially the philosophy is we should not compromise these advantages. We should push them as far as is technologically uh, achievable. The other point is, stems from something I said before. Observing time on DLT will be extremely expensive. You will only get it if you have a really uh, exquisite science case to do. If, if you only, 
if DLT is the only tool that allows you to do something, you cannot possibly do it with another instrument. So in fact, not only is DLT not a survey telescope, no one's gonna give you the telescope for a year or even for a month, and even the night is debatable, uh, but you should not think of DLT as a classical telescope at all. You should think of it as an exquisite science experiment. A little bit like the LHC that you build to, with two or three or four science goals in mind. So, so in fact, the, uh, the philosophy of these astronomical collaborations are getting closer and closer to the philosophy of particle physics experiments. So this is again, a, a sociological point, it, it, it's an interesting. Okay, so what is the science of the ELT? So, so the ELT can essentially be revolutionary in, in all areas of, uh, of, of astronomy and astrophysics. So I can only mention some highlights. Um, so starting from the large scale to the small scale, um, the LT will allow us to characterize planets, in particular their atmospheres, and find biosignatures. So if you want to say it, uh, in a little bit of, um, of, of a simple way, maybe finding life elsewhere in, in the universe. Uh, and, and this includes spectroscopy observations, but includes even direct imaging from, uh, at least from, from, from nearby planets. And it will also allow us to understand in detail the process of, of formation of planets. And then it will allow us to study uh, representative populations of stars um, in, in the, at least in the nearby universe. So we have to realize that for galaxies nearby, we can see individual stars, but for galaxies far away, we cannot resolve individual stars with current telescopes. So, so in particular, there's, there's no elliptical galaxies in our neighborhood. So, so there's only spiral galaxies. So, we, so to that extent, we haven't yet sample, a fair sample of all the stars and galaxies in the universe. Um, so the LT will, will allow us to do that. Um, so on the scale of, of galaxies, uh, what's usually known as the end of the dark ages, so the formation of the first stars and the first galaxies, um, is, is a very hot topic in, in astrophysics th these days. Um, and it's something that, that the LT will allow us to understand, in particular, understand the role of black holes in, in the, uh, the formation and development of galaxies. So, so now it's known that there's a black hole in, in the center of most galaxies, but, but the role of the black hole is, is not yet um, completely understood. Um, and then moving to larger scales to fundamental cosmology, which again is, is the area I work on, so I'm my view here is maybe slightly biased. Um, it will allow us to understand whether the laws of physics are universal, so whether they apply in the rest of the universe as well as they apply here, they're the same laws. Um, it will allow us to characterize dark energy, to understand whether dark energy is a cosmological constant or something else. And it will allow us to do something that might seem extremely simple to you, but it's actually extremely hard, which is to watch the universe expand in real time. Which means you look at the galaxy or a distant object tonight, it's at a certain redshift from you. If you look at the same galaxy again a little bit later, and if that galaxy is, only, is simply following the expansion of the universe, that galaxy must be at a different redshift. If you can see that, if you can measure that, you're, you're seeing the universe expanding in real time without making any assumption about any model about the behavior of gravity or anything else. This is a very neat idea. It was proposed in the 1960s, but so far it has not been done. We've never seen the universe expand in real time. We will be able to do it, we hope, with the LT. Can the LT has synergies with various other facilities already operational or being built? So there's ALMA, there's Euclid, uh, there's the James Webb Telescope, uh, there's a square kilometer array and, and so on. So obviously these, these facilities don't work in isolation, that there's, there's synergies that, that can be explored. And again, there's the discovery potential. So, so maybe the, the most revolutionary discoveries, discoveries of the LT will be some that, that are completely 
uh, unimaginable right now, and, and this gets also part of the one of the insights. So I've been involved in the LT since since 2012. So I'm a member of what's called uh, the LT Project Science Team. So this is an advisory board, essentially, to ISO uh, that provides recommendations on various aspects of science. I, I, I don't have time to describe this in detail now, but I can explain it later in the questions if, if you're curious. So, so at the bottom, you see the list of either current or former members of, of the project science team. Uh, so, so essentially, each person is a specialist in a different area, from cosmology, which is my case, to, to planets, to uh, adaptive optics, to various aspects of instrumentation. Um, so, and our goal is, is to try and extract as much science from the, from the from the project as we can, given constraints of budget. So here's a so here here's some of the people that, that are members of the team. So this is an old picture; it's around uh, 2013. But it, just so you can associate some faces to, to these uh, committees. Um, so here, just for for illustration, is you don't need to. to to understand the, the, uh, the plot in detail, but it's an example of a study I did with, with some, some students in Porto to understand essentially a trade off of the wavelength range of some instrument. Obviously, each instrument can only observe in a range of wavelengths, and depending on the wavelength range you have, you can do more or less science. So, this is something that you have to quantify before you put these numbers on the contract. Uh, so, these things have to be studied well in advance. Um, so what is the status at the moment? So some of the instruments of the LT, so what's called first light instruments, are in an advanced stage of design. So, so they passed what, what's called the preliminary design reviews. Sorry about all, all these um, acronyms, but when, you, when you're a member of various committees, you have to deal with all these acronyms. Um, so, so they passed preliminary design review and are, are now going to final design review. Uh, there's a second generation of instruments uh, that have started what's called phase B. So the detailed design is being done now. And what's called technical first light is currently foreseen uh, for the end of 2025. Now, even COVID is not clear uh, how this number will shift. It will certainly shift a little bit, hopefully not by much. Uh, but it's something that's coming in, in the near future. It's not just a plan. People are, are building stuff both on the mountain and in various labs that are building these trees. Uh, people are also working on various technical aspects. So here's uh, a diagram of various working groups having, uh, you know, studying specific aspects of um, adaptive optics performance, corrections for lines from the atmosphere, subtracting sky on various data sets. Uh, simulating instrument pipelines and so on. And again, I'm involved here because I'm, I'm the coordinator of the line calibrations working group. Um, and our goal is essentially to make sure that the information that we need to do very high resolution spectroscopy is available. One, one type of information you need is the wavelengths of some transitions that we see in astrophysical spectrographs measured in the lab. Because when you look at them in astrophysical systems, they're going to be red shifted due to the expansion of the universe. But you need to know what is the starting point. So what is the wavelength of, of each transition in, in the lab? And this needs to be done extremely precisely. And in some cases, uh, we'll need to ask um, experimental physicists to remeasure some of these lines, because without that, we cannot do our science. So to some extent, Astronomical spectrographs are more precise in measuring wavelengths of some, of some transitions than people can do currently in the lab. And our other task is to come up with new ways of calibrating these instruments. So nowadays, people are starting to calibrate astronomical instruments using laser frequency combs. Uh, but we're thinking of even more advanced ideas, uh, like putting a an atomic clock and a laser comb on a drone or maybe on a satellite that's orbiting the Earth. Uh, and then the telescope will just look at, at, that, uh, at that satellite. There's advantages in doing that. 
again, which I can explain. If, if, uh, one thing that has not been decided curiously is the name of the telescope. So at the moment, we just call it the Extremely Large Telescope, which, you know, it's, it does what the name says. So, so it's not false advertising, but perhaps a slightly better name would be uh, more appropriate. But ESO is, is made of a bunch of different member countries. That, so coming up with a name that everyone agrees with uh, is it, a difficult task. It's not a task for scientists, but it's a, it's a difficult task anyway. So one thing that is missing is also to, to give the telescope a name. So hopefully in about five years from now, uh, the ELT dome uh, will open for the first time. You know, what, what once the sun is setting in, in, in the west in Chile. So, so if you're in Amazon, as you can see the Paranal Mountain uh, ahead of you. Um, and hopefully some of you will, will be able to point the telescope uh, at, at, at the sky and you know, find whether there is life out there or what, what is accelerating the universe, whether Einstein was right or not, or Again, you may find something else that is uh, completely unknown and being unknown, I'm, I'm not able to, to put it on a slide. Okay, we, and with that, I'll, I'll stop. I don't know how I'm doing for time, but we can, we can take some questions. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Professor Carlos. Do you have any questions? Here, let me see. You should be able to unmute and start video if you have any questions, so just unmute yourself and ask. Have one, Nicholas. Uh, you can unmute yourself if you want. And on the camera. Hello. Hi. Um, I want to ask uh, how much of a travel will Starlink be and other future satellite constellations for this type of telescopes? Um, it's certainly problematic. Um, how much? Um, it depends on what type of science you want you want to do. And it also depends on your ability to be able to predict when the telescopes are passing overhead. Right. So assuming you, you know exactly when they pass and, and you can just uh, plan your observations not to point at the satellite. So in principle, that's manageable. On the other hand, in some cases, so depending on the science you want to do, you want to take very long exposure. So, you know, 20 minutes, one hour, something like that. And then you can only do your science if you can expose for one hour, one direction of the sky, and not have a, a satellite cutting through, through the image, right? So, so that is um, it's potentially very problematic. It's something that, ESO is obviously very worried about and studies are being done. I don't think other than realizing that it's a problem, so, so, so that's clear for everyone. I don't think there's a, a detailed quantification of how much of a problem it is, but it, it will be a problem for sure. Thanks. Thank you. 